I'm fond of saying you can't have free without the dumb. Freedom is actually spelled F-R-E-E-D-U-M-B, dumb. Freedom is directly tied to the amount of dumb that we tolerate. I say that because of days like yesterday. President Joe Biden handed Medal of Freedom Awards to 17 Americans, including Simone Biles and Megan Rapino. Biles is just 25 years old. She's most famous for quitting during the Olympics. Rapino is a superstar in soccer. She's most famous for bitching and moaning about America and being the purple-haired Colin Kaepernick. Biles received her award because she's black. Rapino was honored because she's gay. It's dumb, but you can't be free without the dumb. Happy Friday. The weekend is here. Welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I am Jason Whitlock, your host. Uh, we have an awesome, awesome show to get you into the weekend. Uh, I'm not going to set a full fire. I I'm sorry. I apologize. It's the weekend's here around the corner. I'm looking for forward to the weekend. Uh, we've had a great week of fire starters. I got a little fire I'm gonna start, a little bonfire, then Steve Kim's gonna come in and help me fan those flames. And it's about the Biden and the Medal of Freedom stuff that I just teased you there. Uh, Steve Kim's gonna help me with that conversation. Shamika Michelle, uh, she's gonna be here to help me make it make sense of Macy Gray. Macy Gray's flip-flopping everywhere on the transgender issue. Uh, Virgil Walker. Uh, he's going to be here. He's kind of a, a, a fearless contributor. We're going to test out today. He's written something very, very interesting, a letter to black ministers around the country about the abortion issue. Uh, I've tweeted out uh, Virgil's uh, blog post about this. You should go hunt it up on my Twitter feed. It's awesome. Uh, it'll help you understand this conversation I'll have with uh, Virgil. And then, of course, uh, the smartest man on the show, Delano Squires, will be here uh, to help us wrap up the show. Delano's written a terrific column about what he calls the great uh, separation. And that's a feud, a war that's going on within the black community, the, the whole LGBTQ transgender issue is uh, going to separate the wheat from the chafe. Is that what they say? going to separate the men from the boys. I know they say that. Uh, but anyway, uh, fantastic show uh, for us here on this Friday to get us into the weekend. Uh, you know, I, I want to start with some just brief comments and setting up some context uh, to uh, the conversation I want to have with uh, Steve Kim here in just a few seconds. Simone Biles and Megan Rapino. Presidential Medals of Freedom is the highest civilian award uh, that, that the president can give out. I, I, I want to play little uh, clips from, from them yesterday so you can hear why they got these awards. I, I think we have those clips of Biles and Rapino and, and why they got those awards. Overcoming great odds, Simone Biles is the most decorated American gymnast in history. A former foster child who became a once-in-a-generation athlete, transforming her sport with artistry and degrees of difficulty that reimagine what is possible. With absolute courage and honesty, she expands the legacy of our greatest champions who challenge the powerful and speak up for justice and the wellness of body and mind. Leaning on faith in God and family, Simone Biles is an inspiring symbol of strength, grace, and pride in those three letters, USA. Yeah. World she Cup quit. champion, Olympic gold medalist, named the world's best women's soccer player, Megan Rapinoe is one of America's great athletes. Known for her creative play and leadership, she also leads with a fierce will off the field. A champion protecting the rights of fellow LGBTQI plus Americans. A leader on the U.S. women's soccer national team, perhaps the most dominant of any team in any sport, 
in their successful fight for equal pay. Megan Rapinoe challenges and inspires millions of people who believe in themselves and the possibilities of our nation. How you choose to have sex does not make you a hero. Trust me, I know that. From, from <laughs> how I choose to have sex does not make me a hero. And it doesn't matter whether you're a giver or a receiver. And so uh, Megan Rapino, just literally, would she be getting that award if she wasn't gay? No, she would not. I don't, I, you know, I don't follow the women's national soccer team that close, so I, but in this last Olympics, I don't think she was, or World Cup, I don't think she was our best player. Most outspoken, most flamboyant, most hate look at me with her purple hair and all that other crap she does. The most uh, Colin Kaepernick-esque. It, it, she did not, a presidential medal of freedom? Are you kidding me? Simone Biles, great Olympic gymnast, no doubt about it. But she quit at the Tokyo Olympics. She quit. Citing, you know, she just didn't feel right. And I get it. That's fine. I'm not trying to rip her for quitting. I'm ripping her and ripping the Biden administration for giving someone the Presidential Medal of Freedom when the last time they were on the big stage, they let their teammates in the United States of America down. She did something selfish and narcissistic. As I said at the time, Simone Biles did not want to compete in those Olympics. Her mind was wrapped around 2020 is my last year and then I can move on from all of this. When those Olympics got pushed back a year to 2021, she mentally checked out. She wasn't woman enough to say, you know what? I'm old, I'm, you know, I'm in my 20s. Most gymnasts retire around 19, 20 years old. I don't wanna do this. She wasn't woman enough to do that. She took all the money, she took all the endorsement deals, she took all the, the marketing and the PR to build her brand. And then when she got over to Tokyo, she quit. And then she spun it into how heroic and how courageous it is that I'm quitting because I have to do what's best for my mental health. You could have done that a year ago, a year. You denied another woman, another gymnast, an opportunity to actually go and compete and be on that team. Medal of Freedom, youngest Medal of Freedom winner, just a, a year after quitting in the Olympics on the biggest stage in all of sports. Presidential Medal of Freedom. That's because excellence, the meritocracy, the uh, giving it all, our, our culture has been under a complete 180 that the things that used to matter don't matter anymore and success is defined by diversity, inclusion, and equity. That's the goal of life. That's America's goal, diversity, inclusion, and equity. Th that's a luxury. That's something nice to have. It's not the end all be all. Excellence is. And, and I'm just sorry, black people, particularly as it relates to athletics, we don't need charity to excel and to be recognized as great. Why we're handing Simone Biles this charity? It's an insult. It's stupid. It's not the right message for young people. Okay, and I know we're in this whole deal. Oh. Athletes in the past, Ronnie Lott cutting off the tip of his finger to play, that's stupid. 
Kerry Strug, I think that's the one that went out there on the bad ankle and stuck the landing. That was stupid. She should have done what's best for her. This whole narcissistic generation and culture that we have built, this whole selfie, everybody, hey, look at me and let me go to my social media feed. All of it's garbage and it's undermining America and these presidential medals of free dumb, D-U-M-B, annoy me and I had to get that off my chest. Uh, Steve Kim, the Korean Cosell, uh, I want to uh, welcome you into this conversation. Uh, are you as bothered by these presidential medals of freedom as I am? Jason, first of all, good Friday to you. I'm actually a little bit surprised, pleasantly. I, I would have thought Leah Thomas would have also got one, too. I mean, she checks even more boxes. <laughs> but, but this goes right in line with the Biden administration. I mean, winning an award such as that, it's almost like winning an award for best Mexican cuisine from Taco Bell. What, what's it really mean? And you're right. This is all about diversity and checking boxes and virtue signaling. You know, as it relates to Simone Biles, I give her a little bit of a break because she is younger, perhaps more impressionable and prone to being influenced. But you're right. If a football player actually quit in the middle of the second quarter of a playoff game and certainly a Super Bowl, nobody would call them courageous. They would not be getting the game ball. I have never actually seen a little kid go up to any athlete and say, sir, can I have your autograph? The way you just pulled yourself out of the game from mental, hellness, mental wealth and hellness has really inspired me. That's never happened. Not in real life. And just think about this. The 91 Pistons, when they walked out about, what, 30 seconds before the Bulls were officially the Eastern Conference Championship. In a game that they had essentially already played, the game was over. They get criticized to this day for that. That game was over. Randy Moss one time walked off the field, I think at Washington, as Minnesota's playoffs um, chances vanished. In a game where he, the offense, I don't think, ever got back on the field, and he was so frustrated, he just said, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm out of here. He, he doesn't get credit for saying, man, you know what, maybe he was in a mentally bad space and so frustrated that, you know what, he gets a game ball for that. I, we have truly lowered the bar for what gets these type of prestigious awards. But I want to go back to Megan Purplehair. I find her contemptible on so many levels. I'm going to be honest, as a proud American, that if she was still on the U.S. women's soccer team, if they played Al-Qaeda uh, or the Taliban, <laughs> I'd root for them. I'm being serious. I, I'm going to be fearless. I'm going to keep it real here. She's been fundamentally dishonest in so many things. She actually said one time at a, at a White House press conference or something, I'm Megan Rapino. I'm a female athlete, and I could do anything a man can do. Well, outside of play as well as them and be athletically robust, yeah, you can't. And then she had the nerve to talk about this transgender issue in sports, to tell all of these young women and their fathers and mothers across the board, hey, your youth female teams and your participation doesn't matter. Hey, Megan, you are a product of Title IX, much like many of your teammates. Where do you think these athletic careers begin and right there, it showed me she has an, not an ounce of integrity to, in any of her bones. I, I don't want to pretend like, and, and I think these are two of the worst, if not the two worst Medal of Honors ever given out, but there have been other allegedly questionable uh, presidential medals of honor. Let, let's, I think we have a list here of some that we've identified. In 2008, uh, Steve, Anthony Fauci uh, received a presidential <laughs> Medal of Honor. Uh, okay. Tony Blair, if I'm right, Tony Blair, wasn't he the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom? Uh, you can, uh, yeah. Uh, Bill Clinton, uh, I don't mm. did Monica Lewinsky give him that? I, could, I think it was a pearl. <laughs> Necklace Medal of Freedom oh, that uh, Bill hey Clinton now. received. Uh-oh, uh-oh, hey, <laughs> uh, hey. 
Ellen DeGeneres, uh, she got, I guess she beat Megan Rapino to the punch uh, and got one in 2016. Hey, Joe Biden in 2017, uh, I think Robert Byrd uh, hung uh, a hood and a uh, Medal of Freedom around Joe Biden's neck for that. Uh, Rush Limbaugh got it from uh, President Trump. Uh, Jim Jordan, personal friend of mine, uh, wrestler Jim Jordan, got one in 2021. And I don't, I don't, someone may have to help me out. I don't know who Sandra Lindsay is, uh, but she's on this list as well. Uh, got one in 2022, which I guess was just uh, yesterday. Uh, <laughs> so as best we could tell, I think Obama gave out like 132. Uh, this is according to Wikipedia, the 132 Medal of Freedom uh, Honors. Like, you know, this started in 1963. Uh, with John Kennedy, he started this tradition. Uh, Obama has the record, 132. I think Bill Clinton is next with around 110 or so. Uh, so it, it seems we, this may be some sort of tradition here with the Democratic presidents giving out a bunch of them. Trump only gave out like 24. That might be because you know half the country would have refused to accept one from Trump uh, <laughs> <laughs> during his tenure. Uh, but I, just for some clarity, I want to state what the description of the Presidential uh, Medal of Freedom. The Presidential Medal of Freedom is the nation's highest civilian honor presented to individuals who have made exemplary contributions to the prosperity, values, or security of the United States, world peace, or other significant societal, public, or private endeavors. I mean, so, I mean, you, you hear that and you automatically think Megan Rapino, Simone Viles. Uh, Simone redefined quitting, and Megan Rapino has redefined scissoring. <laughs> you, know, you know what's maddening? I'm about going full both. Shamika today. I'm just you, off you the really chain. Are. Here we oh, go. You really know, are. You know what's maddening? Uh, and I know this has to irk your nerve when you heard, as Cool Mo D once said, the the white columnist who is now so chick. And yeah, I dropped my first expletive on this show, so get that beep ready. They actually write about these subjects in glowing terms. And I just wonder, do you, any of you mean a single scintilla of what you're writing? These guys are so afraid of their jobs and for the outrage that they're going to create by merely telling the truth. They don't want to be canceled. They have no other job options. So they're almost forced to say, yeah, these two are the upper echelon of athletics and societal uh, standards that we that we uphold. And I'm proud of them. I mean, it, it's amazing that I remember when the, the Simone Biles situation took place, that literally like these major headline columnists across the country were arguing with people on Twitter who merely said, you know, the difference is it's one thing to back out of an event like the Olympics or let's say a season and do it before it even begins. They threw all logic out the, the uh, window by saying, no, no, she could quit at any time and she's to be commended. And, and I was like, th you cannot really believe that in your own heart of hearts. But I believe that once again, they, all, they want the ticket to the cookout, but they also want social acceptance. And, and I believe there's also an agenda with corporate media to make sure that they, everyone's in lockstep with the message. You know what I found highly ironic, uh, Jason? I don't know if you knew this about me. My all-time favorite boxer and maybe athlete was marvelous Marvin Hagler. And he actually passed away Mar yeah, March 13th, 2021, he died. It was actually one of the few times I got emotional over a death of somebody I had never met once, unfortunately. Never happened for me as a boxing writer. It's probably something I'm going to regret forever. But on the one-year anniversary several months ago was the same exact day on a Sunday that Na Naomi Ahsoka, that whatever her name is, did one of her jobs again where she courageously quit and said, I can't do media and I got to quit. And, and she's doing a magazine shoot the next day, showing up to the Met Gala. Right. And, and I'm thinking to myself and I wanted to make this comparison then, but we never brought it up. Think about Marvin Hagler. He had to move from Newark to Brockton, Massachusetts at a very young age because the Newark race riots grows up uh, in Brockton, Massachusetts, which is basically all white. When he began his career in boxing, his strength and conditioning program, Jason, five, six days a week, you know what it was? It was working a construction job for seven years before he actually trained. He'd run in the morning, get breakfast, work in a construction yard, a full shift, then go to the boxing gym, 
repeat that. Then for a full decade or so, he's literally blackballed from the middleweight tournament, and he's got kids and a wife to raise, making very little money before he makes it big. Jason, you don't think marvelous Marvin Nathaniel Hagler had mental anguish? You don't think he had stress? You don't think at times he was angry at the world? But the way, the reason why uh, I admire him is that he persevered and was forged through this, uh, this time and place when America may have not always been fair to a man like him, and he became an American icon. There, came a, there was a point in time in our society, we praised those who overcame. Now we praise those who capitulate. Those who su succumb. All right, let's get to our approval rating on Simone Biles. This will be very interesting here. Uh, we're both critics of uh, Simone Biles. Can we keep her out of the dumpster fire? Uh, let's see. Uh, job performance, I'm just sorry. When you quit on your team at the Olympics, you quit at the Super Bowl of your sport, I just can't. I can't go there. I can't give her. She's, it's a zero for me. Mm, you know, oh boy, you know I like to give my zeros. I, I, I've thrown no, more no-hitters than Nolan Ryan. But I looked at the overall scope of her performance. Let me make this clear. She's a highly accomplished athlete. I mean, you look at her trophy case, a lot of medals, a lot of gold. So based on that, if it wasn't for the quit job, she'd get like close to 25. But you're right, quitting at the Olympics, that's almost inexcusable. That knocks her down to a 10. Can't believe you're going soft, Steve. Uh, no, I, character. I am. I'm a marshmallow. Uh, <laughs> character. I, I'm, I'm going low here as well. You look your teammates in the eye at the Olympics and you quit in the middle of the event and, and you take all that attention away from them that someone else could have replaced her. I, I, I give her a four in character. Yeah, speaking of which, I remember those press conferences when they asked their teammates about that. And all of them, it's almost like they had a gun to their back. And they're like, oh, yeah, we're all behind her. <laughs> yeah, we all say, I'm like, oh, God, I, I felt sorry for those young ladies. You know what? I, I am going soft. I'm the state puff marshmallow man today. Look, overall, I don't think she's been nearly as damaging to American psyche um, as Ms. Rapineau. I'm going to stick with a 10. Oh, it's the whole Rapino uh, conversation is why you're going yeah. soft. You, you would it would have been all zeros if we had been talking about Megan Rapino. You've gone soft right. here. Authenticity. Uh, I, she's on brand for a woke millennial. Is, is she even a millennial at 25? Is that generation over? Is 25 still cracked that? Anyway, she's as woke as any other young athlete, and actually halfway believes the stuff that's been programmed into her brain. So I gave her a 12 for authenticity. Okay, I, I must be a Sim, Simone Briles pom-pom waiver. I gave her a 15. I, look, I actually believe a lot of these younger people, and look, we're a lot old now. Like you told me last week about college football realignment, and you said, yeah, but Steve, we're old. Uh, I get it. We're not exactly Walt Kowalski yet, but we are now telling kids to get the hell off our lawn. But I did give her a 15, because she's. I think she's young and impressionable. And I would like to see what her worldviews are in about five to ten years, see if they evolve at all. Let me tell you this. If you go high on it factor, I'm, I'm going to start a rumor that you must be chasing uh, some, some black <laughs> oh, tang no. or something. Because oh, no. You're, you're oh, playing no. real nice with uh, no. Simone Biles here. You must have a secret black girlfriend or crush on some uh, black woman that you're not telling me about. It factor. She's dating an NFL player. She's got a presidential medal. She's done a bunch of commercials. She, you know, she is an exciting gymnast. I gave her a 20 in it factor. Okay, you know what? You better not get on my backside. And by the way, that last thing you just said had me thinking of Jungle Fever, one of Spike Lee's most underrated movies. Uh, I gave her a 22. She, look, she was a celebrated gymnast. She's gotten endorsements. She gets a lot of uh, accolades. Look, she got invited to the White House. So, you know, say what you want. And I did not want to get her into a dumpster fire. I think her overall body of work deserved for her to be at least kept out of that realm. Steve, I haven't checked your Twitter feed in a while. I see your tweets, but I haven't gone to your bio. But 
Th this whole thing, because right now you got her at a 55 and candlelit. Right. I've got her at yeah. 36 and dumps. I got. I'm gonna go see who you're following right now. Yep, there it is. T.R. Mac. I knew you were up to something. Oh, you just started up. following T.R. Mac, the state <laughs> senator from Rhode Island. You saw that twerking video. The twerkosaurus. <laughs> this is slanderous. I may res. I folks. Believe the old Kemp. I am not following Twerkasaurus. Do not believe Whitlock. That is a slanderous lie. Lies, lies, I lies. I guarantee you, if I hop into your DMs, you and TR Mac been going back and forth. <laughs> I knew that twerk video was too much for you. Yeah. Got she is Simone Biles at candle in the 55. <laughs> she No, she's thick. Yeah, yeah. She's thick, uh, like drum better. I agree yeah. on that. All right, right let me take better. care of some business. I got to let you go. I got to let you go, Steve. Take care of some business. All right, we've definitely had some tough times, but we recently had some wins for truth in the American family. The pendulum may swing back at any moment, but the center of that change has to be the family, your family. Ronald Reagan once said, all great change in America starts at the dinner table. Well, there's no company doing more to help you bring your family and friends to the table than Good Ranchers. Good Ranchers delivers 100% American meat experience to your door. They guarantee your meat that it's born, raised, and harvested here in the U.S. So you know who you're supporting. I have personally tried it, and this is truly a great product. The T-bones, burgers, ribeyes, and even the chicken. It's all some of the best I've ever had. I mean, they age every cut to perfection so that you can enjoy a true steakhouse experience every single time. Every box is superior quality, flavor, and value. Good Rancher supports American agriculture and business. They support us and what we do and what we believe. So go check them out. Support those who support us, your country, and taste buds. They support it all. Your taste buds are going to thank us later. Uh, make sure to use my promo code FEARLESS to get $30 off your order, plus get free express shipping. You can make gatherings at the table common again with Good Ranchers. Take advantage of this offer before it's gone. Go to GoodRanchers.com FEARLESS to start bringing people to the table, creating change in America, and eating seriously delicious food from Good Ranchers. All right, Shamika Michelle. <laughs> All right, welcome back. Uh, time for some make it make sense. And uh, we'll go out to uh, North Carolina, bring in Shamika Michelle, see if she can make it make sense. Macy Gray, uh, the singer. Uh, Shamika, I'm sure you saw this. She went on Piers Morgan show and she said one thing about the transgender issue. And then she went through three days of re-education and she said something else on uh, the Today Show. Let, let's start with what she said on Piers Morgan. Let, let's play that first. And I, I will say this, and everybody's gonna hate me, but as a woman, just because you go change your parts doesn't make you a woman. Right. Sorry. You feel that? I know that for a fact. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sounded pretty confident and pretty strong and pretty much like common sense to me. Uh, but three days of re-education, and uh, here she is now on the Today Show with Hoda. Well, I, I don't know how to say Hoda's last name, but anyway, let's play the clip. Well, uh, I never, of course, meant to hurt anybody with with uh, what I said. I'm a, I'm actually a huge. Uh, I think it takes a lot of courage to be yourself, to, to to go out in the world and be honest about who you are. And uh, so I think anyone who is uh, in the LGBT community is a hero and, and sets an example for all of us with that, you know? Mm. Uh, she later went on to basically backtrack and stutter about the whole transgender issue. They they completely re-educated Macy Gray in, a, in just three days. Uh, make it make sense for me, Shamika. Uh, Jason, this makes perfect sense because if you lean on who you believe sustains you, 
Macy Gray believes her fans and the record execs sustain her. If she believed in the ultimate sustainer, the person that's greater than any fan, greater than any hater, greater than any executive of any company, she would lean on his truth, which is male and female created he them. You know, if you're a tree planted by the water, the still water, the living water, someone can summons and send out all their flying monkeys. You will not be moved. As you know, Jason, that people are trying to make me backtrack. But I don't moonwalk because I'm not Michael Jackson. And I don't bend over because this ass says exit only. But when you think that somebody else is where you get your blessings from, that's what you do. So it makes perfect sense that Macy folded just like so many before her have. I, I think you're right. I could have never said it uh, that cleverly. Uh, and, and yeah, I... I She's got a new album coming out, and I'm sure someone got on the phone and was like, hey, if you want this album to come out, you better back that ass up. Right, <laughs> and exactly. That's what, <laughs> she tried and to that's walk what away, she but she, she, she choked. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I watched this uh, clip uh, originally in, in its entirety, and, and I, it just reconfirmed and restated to me, this is why I had to, to leave Los Angeles and leave corporate media, is because I'm just not going to bow to stupidity. And, and right. you know, I used, to, uh, I used to say this, this is kind of related to the conversation we were had yesterday, me, you, and Jill Savage, about relationships. And, and, and it's, it's Relationships a lot of times, and particularly between man and woman, people love to say it's based on compromise. You gotta be willing to compromise. And <laughs> I, used, I was famous in my 20s and 30s and people would get mad at me. I would say, compromise? I'm not gonna meet you halfway to stupidity. What, <laughs> what am I compromising on? Either we are gonna agree on the truth but I'm not going to meet you halfway to stupidity. I don't know if my position was right. I have some regrets uh, to some degree for that attitude and it's probably arrogance, but that is who I am. I I'm just, right. I'm gonna stand on truth. And this woman has stated something that was so factually obvious and to see, she couldn't even hardly make eye contact with Hoda and, and the people, because mm -hmm. she was so embarrassed, she knew she was lying. Right. I'm just, I, I, I can't do that. I, I just can't, I can't do it. Yeah, I was thinking, Jason, I feel sorry for her because when she was talking to Pierce Morgan, she looked like she had a little more confident. As she was talking to Hoda, if that's her name, Huda, what is it, Hoda? She looked so beaten down. She looked beaten down. She didn't look like she believed what she was saying. And I just felt really sorry for her. Like, wow, this is it. This is what you have to do. You have to bow to the establishment when you feel like they are where your blessings flow from. You know, if that's where you think your help come from, then that's where you're gonna you're gonna lean on and and think that sustain, they sustain you. It's I felt sorry for Macy looking at that second clip. And so only I'm only asking you this because I know you love music. You do a little singing yourself. I can't off the top of my head think of what Macy Gray's most famous song is. Is she any good? And I'm sure I've heard some of her music, but she says a, her talking voice is unique. And I'm wondering what, because it doesn't come up in my head immediately what her most famous song is. Is she talented? I try to say goodbye and I choke. I try to walk away and I stumble. I, though I try mm. to hide it, it's clear. My world crumbles when you are not near. Something like that. I, 
I don't think she has the best voice, but I did have that album. I have to say, I liked it. She had some really good songs. I think she's a great songwriter. And I think that's what happened. She wanted to hide behind her songwriting ability and someone as she sang the song, trying to teach it to somebody else said, no, you should be the artist. And that's how she became the artist instead of just the songwriter. Thank you, Shamika. Great job as always. Enjoy your weekend. Uh, get your Fearless Army swag at shopblazemedia.com backslash fearless. Virgil Walker in his letter to black pastors. X. All right, welcome back. Uh, been looking forward to uh, doing this interview for a couple of days. Uh, Virgil Walker of G3 Ministries, he's the co-host of the Just Thinking podcast. Uh, he wrote a piece, uh, a blog post, a letter to black pastors uh, that I found fascinating. It, it, it addressed the issue of the black church, black ministers, and how we're handling or how they are handling the abortion issue. Uh, particularly since the overturn of Roe versus Wade. And uh, the letter is beautifully constructed. Uh, his position is powerfully argued. Uh, if you go to my Twitter page, at Whitlock Jason, I've tweeted out uh, Virgil's piece. Uh, when we will bring Virgil on, he can tell you how to find him over social media and how to easily find, find the column. But uh, he gets right to the heart of many of the matters, even connecting uh, faith leaders, seemingly pro-choice position to Dr. Martin Luther King and his relationship with Planned Parenthood and Margaret Sanger and the eugenics movement to pointing out, he, Virgil argues, three, there are three primary reasons why uh, the black church has been silent or in support of abortion. Uh, we've got a, one, a financial partnership with white liberals, uh, two, political gain, and then three, po uh, cultural popularity to win the approval of feminists. He, he basically argues, the black church and black ministers have sold out and we need to deal with that. Virgil, welcome to the show. We're honored to have you. Uh, I wanna start with, how has your letter uh, been received? Yeah, well, Jason, thanks for having me. It's an honor to be with you. Been a fan of the show for quite some time and uh, it's, it's, been, it's been mixed as you can imagine. I mean, there, there are uh, those who appreciate the candor and the clarity uh, that I shared regarding the article. Uh, there are others who, again, in and, and like fashion, uh, were rather upset uh, about what it is I, I shared. Now, as, as someone who's, who's served uh, as a pastor uh, for years, uh, who serves in ministry now, uh, and who is, who's, I spent more than six years in the front lines of abortion clinics. Uh, for me, when, when I heard about the decision uh, regarding Roe v. Wade, uh, I, was, I was ecstatic. You know, I was really excited. Never in my lifetime could I have imagined uh, this kind of an outcome. And so when, when I recognized that you know, there, there would be folks who would be upset about this, who would be angry about this, I, I recognize that. And as you said on the show often, uh, you, made the, you made the statement that you know, if, if folks who are secularists or atheists or folks who are uh, non-believers have a worldview that, that differs from ours, uh, we'd have no problem with that. The problem that we have is when we see those who claim themselves to be Christians, uh, who wear the title pastor, uh, who, who actually are, are fashioning themselves as clergy, begin to articulate a worldview that is antithetical to everything they claim to believe. And then they, and then they have the unmitigated gall to stand in the pulpit 
on the Lord's day and utter blasphemies about the nature of God with, la- with, with so little fear in them. In fact, the, the real fear they should have is that God's wrath would actually consume them on the Lord's day and that they would drop dead. But these men don't fear God. They, they articulate a worldview that is antithetical to the biblical worldview that, that we hold dear. And truth be told, they absolutely need to be removed from the pulpit. So again, with all that said, uh, with regard to e- A, the motivation uh, behind writing the piece, as well as what folks have have experienced as a result, uh, you know, they, it's it's been it's been mixed reviews. But again, I'm I'm not I've never been moved by that. So Virgil, you, you're hearing from people that like the piece. You're hearing from people that dislike it, and I'm wondering mm-hmm. if the people that dislike it, who claim to have a faith, are they upset that you criticize the black church, or do they have a substantive disagreement? on how the Bible and how God feels about the issue of abortion. Yeah, there, there's never a substantive argument. Uh, basically, it's, it's, it, it really results, like it always does, uh, from those who hold that worldview. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's ad hominem, right? It's you, you, you're, you're a coon, you're a sellout, you're an Uncle Tom. It's, it's all, the, it's all the, the, the normative tropes that you come to expect uh, when you hold a biblical worldview. Uh, when, when, you, when you don't look away from sin, when you actually acknowledge uh, the sinfulness of sin uh, and, and, and begin to talk to people about these issues. They really don't want to address them and it becomes you become an easy target for their, you know, for, for, for what it is they want to say about you. And, and again, I, you know, you, you, you have a fearless army. Uh, that's been something I've been, you know, been, been a part of for quite some time. But, but again, I, I, I don't, I say that, I say that in this way, Jason, I, I'd heard you the, the other week acknowledge the fact that, uh, you know, Trading barbs on Twitter, uh, you don't have to be brave to do that, right? You, you know, you, you don't have to. You don't have to be the, the bravest person in the world to do that. But it's interesting how, when you do declare truth, how those who hate the truth actually come out and stand against it. And so that's that's exactly what you're seeing. But you don't see any substantive arguments. I think I think the worst that they've actually done or said, uh, they try to challenge uh, Margaret Sanger and her actual view uh, regarding abortion and, and, and things like that. But but most have not really read Sanger in her own words. Uh, most have, have, have really believed uh, the, the revisionist history uh, of, of Planned Parenthood. And so in my piece, I actually quoted uh, specifics from the award that was given to Dr. King so that so that no one could say, well, I misinterpreted Sanger or I thought, you know, I said this and that was that was wrong. I, I shouldn't have looked at it in that way. I just I just used their words uh, so that you could hear from 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 those people. Virgil, I hate to ask this question because it's really irrelevant, but I do have to ask it because we're trying to make people deal with the truth. And so I, I just want to know for clarity's sake, growing up, was your experience in the traditional black church and your work as a minister and in the church now, are you in the black church and working with other black Christians? Yeah, that's a great that's a great question. I I I, I want to first I want to first amplify what you said from the beginning. Uh, it, what color the the group is that I've worked with in the past uh, is irrelevant to truth. Right at the end of the day, uh, however, for those to whom those kinds of things matter, uh, I grew up in a Kojic church. Uh, Kojic, for those who aren't aren't aware, Church of God in Christ, uh, largest one of the largest Pentecostal denominations, uh, you know, in 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 the country. Uh, th- that was a part of my background. I grew up in Black Baptist circles. Uh, that was my growing up the entire time, which is why I have such a a heartstring, an affinity uh, for Black folks. Folks who are still in those churches. I spent a, uh, an enormous amount of time uh, at Carlton Pearson's church. If you're familiar with Carlton Pearson in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, I, I was I was a member there for years before he became uh, heretical in, in the in the ideas that he espoused. So I've, I've been around black circles. I've, I've got the the street cred, so to speak, uh, to if, if if that's what's necessary to tell the truth. Which again, I, I really I, I really reject. Uh, currently, I work uh, 
uh, at an organization called G3. Uh, it is a reformed Baptist setting. The beauty of where I am now uh, is that my skin color is irrelevant to the declaration of the truth that, 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 that we're challenged uh, to deliver on a consistent basis. That's one of the reasons why I love where I am. I'm proud of where I am, proud of what I do. And, and rather than someone looking into my history or trying to figure out what background I'm coming from, what they need to do is grapple with the magnitude and weight of the truth that I shared in that particular article. Uh, I was just having or having this discussion off the air that we will have on the air, but, but th this whole thing of what you're trying to do and what we're trying to do with this show with Fearless, and I know your friends with Delano, he's gonna come on after you, is, is people look at us like we're crazy and we're selling out, but actually what we're trying to do is reach black people who claim a religious faith right. and say, hey guys, are we sure we're standing on biblical values are we letting politics move us away from God? Yeah. That's the real question we're asking, and we're asking it out of love and trying to shake people and say, hey God, we serve a higher calling, a much higher calling than our skin color. We claim to be Christian. That means we claim to be with Christ and the good news of the gospel. And we have to stand on that. So we're actually trying to, with love and affection, pull, you know, reach black people to, that claim a faith. Hey, well, let's stand on this faith together. That will, do, that will serve us all in America and the world to the best of our ability. Yeah. Now, I, I don't disagree with, with much of what you said there, but my, my only thing is we, we you and I and, and others like us probably are a little crazy. Uh, and, and as far as being sold out, we, we, we have. We've sold out to Christ and him crucified. And so we, we don't need to apologize for that. I think we need to stand on that truth uh, and, and declare it with, 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 with great boldness. I do understand the point that you're making. The heart cry is, I desire to see my brothers and sisters who share my complexion walk in the truth that you and I have been blessed to be exposed to, not because of, of the fact that we're so smart. Now, Delano, he may be that smart, uh, but not because <laughs> you and I are, are necessarily that smart, but because of the very grace of God bestowed upon us that, that we're able to go from darkness to light. Uh, and we want everybody else that we know, love, and, 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 and interact with to come into that light. And so I, I see the point you're making. The, the reality is uh, unity, the unity that we seek, uh, the, the foundation of that is truth. And so if we can't begin by exposing people to truth and allowing them to stand on that truth, we'll never actually be united in the way that Christ intended. We had, I had such, and, and I didn't plan to go this direction, Virgil. It's just these thoughts come to my head and I'm, I'm yeah. getting to know you and I appreciate the conversation, but there's a nostalgia. And again, I'm, I think I'm much older than you. I'm 55, but me growing up in a small little black church, 25th street Baptist church in Indianapolis, I have so many fond memories of that entire experience. Yeah. Uh, trips to King's Island with the church, uh, cookouts and camping events and Eagle Creek Park in Indianapolis. We do all these, and, and, and I don't, and as a kid and as a young person, politics weren't at the center of our identity. And so our politics didn't matter nearly as much. And we just right. connected because we were believers and we had things in common. And now I see politics at the center of churches. And, and it's, it's like, wow, it's like, I, because I'm sticking to biblical principles and apply those to how I view the world, even politically, it's like I'm made to feel uncomfortable. Right. Uh, that I'm not gonna stand with the Democrats that support Planned Parenthood, support abortion, uh, think that somehow without their assistance, 
I can't make it in this world. And I'm like, well, I'm on Jesus' team. What do I need you for? Uh, <laughs> but, and so right. I, I just have this nostalgia that I want to return to that time where we could connect one nation, one group of people under God. And, and that's where my, pa- I, I want that energy and flow back. And, and your piece, and this will lead back to your piece, is, is you really get it like, man, this division we're seeing in the church has a long history that goes all the way back to even Martin Luther King. Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't disagree. I, I think that, you know, I, I, I could I wish I had more time and I may have to revisit the, 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 the construct of what you're sharing, because I, I, there was a time when when faith is what brought us together. If you begin to look at the statistics uh, from the, the, the pre uh, civil rights era, what you'll see is that family structures for black families were intact. And this was at a time when there was there was actually greater segregation, uh, that there was actually more laws that, that, that codified racism. Right. You want to talk about systemic racism. Those folks felt it for real, but were actually doing better in, in the in the time frame in which they lived. Why? Because they weren't looking for handouts from government. They were actually standing on their faith. And that's what brought them together and, and kept communities together. Uh, I mean, I, there's a whole lot more I could I could say about that. But I, I agree. And, and with you, what we've done is we've we've really we've really abdicated that we've let that go. And in, a, in, you know, in an effort to, to get something now to gain something now, uh, we've 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 let go of God. Uh, we've latched on to government. Uh, we, we've let go of, of scriptural sufficiency. Right. And, and, and we've, we've we've latched on to social justice. I mean, these are the kinds of things that we're doing in our culture that is actually actually having a damaging effect uh, over the long term. And it, it, it puts guys like you and me uh, back into that nostalgic period uh, when we when we had, you know, grandma's home cooking on Sunday morning and we'd all go over and, and enjoy that. And, and over the course of, the, of time, it, it, it wasn't what government can do. It's what we could do as a people together, united under the banner of faith. That's what it's really about. Virgil, I'm going to let you go on this note. Do you see any light at the end of the tunnel? Do, do, do you, are you hopeful that the black church, black ministers will wake up? Yeah, I, I, I'm hopeful in this regard, Jason. I, I, I recognize that when it is darkest, light shines brightest. Uh, and so, again, I, I applaud what, what you do. My, my brother D- Delano, my man Chalk Knox, uh, those guys, we're, all, we're a band of brothers. You know, behind the scenes, uh, I'll, I'll pick up a phone and, and tell one of them, hey, I'm getting ready to write this article. They'll tell me, hey, I'm getting ready to go on, you know, fearless. I'm going to do this. And so I, what I'm seeing is that there is that camaraderie. There are those people who are are connecting the, the, the dots. My, my brother, Daryl Harrison, that, that I do the, the co-host the show with, we're all connecting with one another to, in an effort to, to get the word out, to get the message out. And, and those who, uh, my goal is never to figure out, you know, uh, how many are coming to that light. My goal is simply to share the truth and allow God to draw those folks uh, to the light. And in that regard, as I'm faithful, I'm definitely hopeful. Virgil, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Would love to have you back. Uh, would love to be a guest on your podcast. Thank you so much. All right, go to youtube.com slash Jason Whitlock. Hit notifications, hit subscribe. If you're listening on Apple, give me that five-star review. All right, uh, Delano Squires. Bears. Welcome back. Time to roll out to D.C., bring in Delano Squires, who's written another uh, tremendous column uh, today for us at The Blaze and for Fearless. Uh, Delano uh, writing about the great separation. Uh, this is, has nothing to do with the great replacement theory, the great awakening, uh, the great new world order, uh, the great debate. It's the great separation. And you're saying that like black people uh, are headed for maybe a final conflict where we have to choose sides. You end the column at challenging us. What side are you going to be on? And my takeaway from reading the column earlier today was Delano is like, there's going to be a side that 
says, you know what? I'm sticking to my biblical values and I'm choosing my biblical values and I'm going to partner with people who share my values, regardless of economics, regardless of color, regardless of anything, do we have shared values? And then on the other side, there are gonna be people that say, I'm going to choose the side that fits my political worldview and my uh, fight for power. Uh, have I misread uh, your column in terms of what the divide is and what the choice is for black people? No, just I, I think you 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 hit it pretty square on. Um, and, and just to be clear, the 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 scene that I that I paint in this particular column is sort of a microcosm of a larger separation that's going on within the country. Right. We talk about it every week. Um, that's not just, you know, within the black community. But but I wanted to talk specifically about you know, the black community because there are certain forces that are unique to us, right? So one one of one section that I actually cut out just because the I was getting up to 2,500 words is the fact that um, even your socially conservative, older, let's say Southern black grandma, right? Sister Pearlie, the, the, the woman that helped propel Joe Biden to his candidacy in South Carolina when he when he was struggling after those first two states. She she believes that marriage is between one man and one woman, right? She would not support biological men and women's sports. But she, just like her atheist granddaughter, feeds at the trough of CNN and MSNBC. She gets a social commentary from Joy Reid and from Don Lemon. And when she hears the name Clarence Thomas, she responds with a, with a frown and a scowl. So whereas within sort of the, the larger, you know, uh, population, particularly among white Americans, you have clear divisions. So, so your the, the white version of Miss Pearlie is not watching CNN and MSNBC. She's watching Fox News. She's watching um, Newsmax. So she's watching some she's watching this show. She's watching other conservative networks. But even socially conservative black folk are uh, tremendously influenced by the black left. So, so part of the reason that I, I want to talk about the great separation is because I can see these forces, this, this tectonic shift happening in real time. Uh, I started by talking about Tiara Mack, the, the twerking senator from, state senator from Rhode Island, who clearly is, is desirous of attention. And she even said it on some of her TikToks that she's trying to go viral so that she can talk here it is, Jason. She not so that she can talk more about what's holding black the black community or improving reading rates or literacy or numeracy. She said she wanted to go viral so that she could talk more about abortion, and that that really is on brand for the Democratic Party for the black left in 2022. It's abortion, it's drag queens, it's transgenderism. Um, and, and, and the black community that used to be built on the pillars of faith and family and education and dignity and hard work, now, as I describe it, the foundation of that house, of, of the new house, is perversion, subversion, diversion, and inversion. Um, and we see this both in terms of individual black leaders I talk about Eric Adams and his pledge to put a, a drag queen in every school like he was a, you know, a, a presidential candidate who said we want a chicken in every pot. Like Eric Adams has a, has a different set of priorities. It's Black Lives Matter that says that they are fighting as, as a, one of their 13 original principles. They're fighting to dismantle the nuclear family. It's the NAACP that says they are fighting so that fewer black babies could be born. Maybe they think 12% of the black population is too high. They want to drive it down into the single digits. And on and on and on, I describe in, in my column all of these forces of the aristocracy, the black elite, the, the, the leadership class, um, have arrayed themselves against the interests of the black masses. And it's one of these things where eventually people are going to have to choose sides because you can't sustain a community where there are no common values, where there's no... Uh, common principles, where there's no morals, where respectability is a pejorative, but calling yourself a boss bitch is a sign of empowerment. 
Um, and that's where we are today. And I'm just trying to get out ahead and paint a picture of where it is that we're going. I'm so appreciative of the column because it's, it's right on brand with what we're trying to do with this whole show. And, and again, the show is for everybody. It, it is for everybody. But I am specifically trying to target and, and, and wave a flag, send up a SOS signal, send out a flare that, to, to black people like, hey, don't surrender your biblical values for politics. I would rather see you abandon politics altogether. That's a choice that I've made. That again, I, I've never voted, although that's likely to change coming up here in November. Uh, I'm just being honest, I've, uh, but I've never voted because I, I don't think politics determine my destiny. And, hmm. and I don't want to be controlled by politics. I would rather be controlled like Shamika was saying, who is my ultimate sustainer? God. And so I'm going to be loyal or try my best as to the best of my ability. I'm a weak man. I, I sin and all that. But I want to live up to and be loyal to those values. And, and I'm trying to let other, it's okay. If the Democrats hate you because you want to be loyal to God, that says more about them than you. It actually says something good about you and something bad about them. And that's what I love about this show and what we're doing and the columns that you're writing. And, and I think, you know, there's a price all of us seem to pay in the black community if, if we stay loyal to our biblical values, we get accused of, oh, we have some political agenda. Right. Uh, and and I, I really, I just don't. There's no proof I have a political agenda. It, it's, it's, I'm going where my values tell me to go and I'm willing to align myself with whoever says and backs up that they share my values. And so if that's the Blades, if that's the Republican Party, if it's Ron DeSantis, I could care less. And, and we have to get in that mindset. And I think the thing that you're saying is the straw that may break the camel's back is the transgender and the LGBT issue, that it's becoming so obvious that we have to hop on board with that agenda or we lose our black status. That may be a bridge too far. Yeah, Jason, there's a couple points I want to make really quick. One, one of the, the most confounding parts of this great separation is that you have self-identified black Christians on either side of the dividing line. And you have black Christians who will affirm and say, yes, I, I have biblical values. But for them, biblical values means ridding America of white supremacy and racism. Right. Over the last week, you and I have both seen multiple videos with with prominent pastors who who shepherd large congregations coming out and criticizing the Supreme Court for overturning Roe versus Wade, which, again, doesn't ban abortion, which I wish it did, but just sends abortion back to the states. And I mentioned Jamal Bryant, who used to have a, a church here in Baltimore and, and now is down in Atlanta, who, you know, he, he talked about overturning Roe versus Wade and criticized it. And he said men need to step up, not as husbands and fathers, mind you, but as abortion supporters. And the, the, in the same video where he talked about his support for abortion, right, he, he couched in the language of choice, but his support for abortion, a couple minutes later, he, he pivoted and said, now we're ready for the baby dedication, right? So it, it's as if these people have no self-awareness, that irony is completely lost on them, um, and he's not the only one. It was a pastor after pastor who I've seen take to the pulpit and say, no, God, in fact, supports abortion and these are churches that ha whose congregations number in the thousands so these are people who have real influence so so that's one of the the, the most challenging aspects of, of this great separation that a lot of people are standing on fault lines and they don't even know it so so when the space opens up they are going to fall through and to your point you talk about the trans issue macy gray is probably one of those people 
right? Soul singer and actress who, talking to Piers Morgan, she said, you know, in, in her sort of uh, unique style, that I, I, I don't think that, you know, if you get surgery, it makes you a woman. And I said, okay, that's, that's, a, uh, that's a reasonable take to me, right? Now, she said, if you say you're a woman, but you're obviously a man, I'll still call you a she. Now, obviously, I wouldn't agree with that because you're lying at that point. But I said, that's about as good as it's going to get on the left. It wasn't even a week later where she showed up on the Today Show and was subjected to a public humiliation. She couldn't even look the host in the eyes squarely. She couldn't finish a sentence um, with any sort of coherent thought. It was all about the education that she received and, and, and you know, and, and if whatever you are, I believe it. And, and this, this is what the black community needs to understand. And, and again, let me go back to black preachers. The, the people who had moral authority, who wielded that moral authority for our, our greater benefit a generation ago. These guys need to understand that today, if you affirm a biblical sexual ethic, the left, including many of your own people, will accuse you of basically burning a rainbow cross on somebody's lawn and say, if you don't get with transgender rights, that you're a hateful bigot. So. This, as I said, this this thing is is coming apart. Now, it's not a revolution; it's, a, it's an evolution. So it's moving somewhat slowly, in terms of what we can perceive with our own eyes. The average person still thinks that race is the biggest issue. The average black person still thinks that race and racism are the biggest issues in this country, right? They see the periodic police shooting, horrific as they may be, and they say, "Well, this is black life in America." and they don't understand all of the plates that are moving beneath their feet and the things that are gonna swallow them up and their children. So I, I thought it was important to raise that issue. And, and one, one other point I wanted to raise quickly, I quoted ta quotes twice in my piece. Once is I was when going I talked there. To, okay, okay. So I, I was so going, I was is, going, let me ask a question. Let me okay, ask okay. you, because I, and I, I don't wanna, but the second time you quoted him, uh -huh. You mentioned his that there's no black problem that can't be solved yes. by the elimination of white supremacy. And it's yes. so crystallized for me what my problem is with ta Coates and these people on the left is, is like, and again, ta Coates I don't think claims to be a Christian or have any religious no. faith that I'm aware of. But those of us that do claim a Christian faith, what he's expressing directly contradicts our faith. There's no, it doesn't say in the Bible, if, if, if white people are on your side, how can you fail? Mm. Or, or if white people are against you, how can you succeed? But if God is on your side, how, you know, don't, don't worry about the haters and, and, and that's, where people like confuse me or uh, other people that are labeled conservatives or people that have a biblical worldview, I'm not sitting around worried about white bigots because God is on my side. I don't see white people as my salvation. I see Jesus Christ as my salvation and my adoption of his values and principles will protect me and allow me to succeed. Yeah, and Coates is, is a central figure in, in the piece because, one, he's, he's one of the more, um, you know, significant public intellectuals, particularly in terms of the written word over the last 15 years. People like Ibram Kendi can't, he couldn't even uh, carry Ta-Nehisi Coates' jockstrap because Ken, Ken, every Kendi column is basically a repetition of racism, sexism, capitalism, homophobia, transphobia, so on and so on and so forth, and racial equity. That's, that's every Kendi column. But Coates is both the person who said, um, they, I'm paraphrasing, they made us a race, we made ourselves a people, right? So he's talking about the impact that slavery and segregation had on sort of forming and fortifying the black community. You had slaves that came from all over Africa, but once they came here, they are what sort of formed or were the genesis of what we now know as black America, right? So we don't identify as Angolan Americans or Gambian Americans, we're, we're black, or some people say African American. But Coase is also the person that said, and to, your, to your point, that there's no problem with black people that the complete and total eradication of white supremacy couldn't fix. 
I cannot think of a less manly statement to make. Ta-Nehisi Coates, for all of his soaring rhetoric, right, and his, his dexterity with the pen, that, that, that is the declaration of a child. What he is doing is putting all agency, all responsibility for the condition of the black community. And, and he didn't write this in 1922. He, he wrote this in like 2016, 2018. He's putting it all on the shoulders of white people. And what I said, similar to what I said in my Clarence Thomas column, is that for the black left, um, or the left in general, this is their worldview on race. White people do things. Black people have things done to them. White people are, are always the subject of the sentence, and black people are always the object. We're not even the star of our own autobiography, Jason. It's the, the white man oppressed us, and now the white man has to come and save us. And you can't build a community with people like that who have such an aversion to responsibility. And, and after that, I, I, I mentioned the quickest way to get the most radical black activists to turn into a White Lives Matter field organizer is to talk about crime in, in large cities like Baltimore, St. Louis, Chicago, New York, Philly. Then you get the question. Now, it's the only time they ask this question. They'll say, well, what about white on white crime? Now, that's curious because they never bring up white people when it, when it comes to police shootings. They never bring up white people when it comes to drug overdoses or suicide or any of the other uh, social maladies or social pathologies that plague the quote unquote white community. But as soon as it comes to talking about violence in our neighborhoods, where black people are 90 percent of the victims and 90 percent of the perpetrators, then all of a sudden they turn into Team United Nations and now they want to care for all the people of the world and sing Kumbaya. And you and I know that that's not that's not real concern. It's a it's a it's a diversionary tactic. It's a dodge. It's it's the clarion call of people who cannot accept accept any responsibility for their behavior. So for me, again, it, it just shows that this is another one of those forces that's pulling the community apart. You can't have a community where people, particularly men, refuse to take responsibility for anything. We, we are going to be a servant class in the next 30 years. There's going to be a small black elite and middle class, and then you're going to have a large, the large black masses who are disproportionately dependent on the government and who exists in the state of multiple partner fertility Right. Every guy's going to have three baby moms and every woman's going to have four baby daddies and uh, uh, perpetual co-parenting. That, that's what it's going to look like in in another 30 years if we do not get our act together. I, I, I want I love your point about how unmasculine Ta-Nehisi Coach's words make him appear. Uh, but here's what he would say and people like him would say. It's like, oh, I want the responsibility of fixing white people. Mm. And that's why, that's what, literally, I, I'm, I'm willing to see, you ain't man enough to do the work of calling out white people and fixing them. And again, that's why, you know, and I'm, I'm not trying to be abusive to people, but I'm just gonna put names on. That's why Emmanuel Acho had a show uncomfortable conversations with a black man where he went out and talked to white people. We yep. love to go out and fix up and play therapist for white people. Mm -hmm. That's why Ebron Kendi X is out collecting money, uh, teaching white people how to not be racist. That's why Ta-Nehisi Coates, every, all of his books are directed at, written for to white people on how they can better themselves. We have established a, 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 a hospital uh, a doctor's office staffed by black liberals that go out mm. and, and their lives are dedicated to improving white people because they think there's some salvation for them in that. And then they turn around and look at me, look at you, look at the people on this show and say, why y'all sitting around talking to black people about how we sh what we should do? It's like, well, hold on. don't we think doctors are good, therapists are good, improving yourself? Because, again, the conversations I'm trying to have, I'm having with myself also. It's all a reminder of me. Jason, improve you, be responsible for you. You have the power. You can take these biblical principles, apply them to you, your family, your friends, your situations, your existence, and things will get better for you. 
I don't have a problem with white people. Everybody knows that about me. I don't have, and again, I'm willing to partner with white people. I'm willing to partner with people who are willing to work on themselves. But, but I'm not sitting around thinking about how I can improve white people because I grew up around black people, my family, most of my friends are black. I want us to embrace things that will improve our life and our existence and our happiness and our salvation here on earth. Coates, Acho, Ibram Kendi, Roland Martin, every, they, their lives are dedicated to improving white people. They should own that. They should, and, and um, you know, we, we've talked about Roland Martin, I've talked about The Root, The Griot. Um, at one point I was doing research on a, on a, for a, a column and I counted, I think there were over 150 articles that The Root had that were tagged white people. Roland Martin has an entire section on his YouTube channel with Karen videos, right? Rude white, middle-aged white women who get into verbal disputes with black folk. These are the things that our sort of ethnic media focus on. Now, they, they will not say a word about the, the hundreds of school children, toddlers to, I'm, if, even if you want to look at toddler, like five-year-olds through eight-year-olds in these big cities who end up getting killed in drive-bys on their porches while they're going to school, while they're walking home from school. None of these outlets will talk about that. But if you find a, a white lady in Sheboygan, wherever the, Sheboygan is, whatever state it's in, and she says a crossword to a black lady as they leave the Target parking lot, oh yeah, Roland Martin's gonna find that. He's gonna find that and he's gonna say, look at, look, we, we, haven't got this, we haven't come very far. Because as you, in the same way, and I've said this before, that the true north of the feminist movement is, is the alpha male, right? Is masculinity. The true north of the anti-racist racist movement is white folks. These, these people are perpetuating an anti-identity. Anti they, they, they have no um, sort of vision for what the future for black folks could and should look like, that they can uh, speak of affirmatively. It's always what they're against, never what they're for. And that's why it, it's not, a, a lot of times people say, oh, black conservatives want to act like racism doesn't exist. No, that's not the case. It's not that I think it doesn't exist. Is that from my own experience, I, I grew up in New York City in a, in a neighborhood that was almost exclusively black by the time I came of age, right? I, I, I've spent all of my life in and around large cities, up and down the East Coast. I'm married to a woman from Houston. The vast majority of black people that I've known in my life have grown up in majority black neighborhoods. So what we say and do to one another actually matters. It doesn't matter what somebody in Iowa says or what they feel about me and my family because they're not around me. So we're the ones who've been pumping our heads full of uh, uh, violence and uh, degradation and drug abuse for the last 30 years, and it's playing out in our actions. So as I said, the, 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 the notion that these things don't matter until white people get their act together is just not something that I can, I can get with. I believe in taking responsibility for the things that you can control. Because if every white person followed Elon Musk to the moon tomorrow and went back to their ancestral European homeland, every single issue that's facing black America today will be staring us in the face tomorrow. And the Roland Martins and the Ibram Kendi's and the Ta-Nehisi Coates and the Cole Hannah Joneses would have nothing to say because their, their entire industry would be up, right? They, they don't have, they have, they, they, they don't, they can't describe again what a future for black folk would and should look like. One that has strong faith, strong family, educational excellence, dignity, self-respect, where a state center would never think about posting a video of herself on a handstand twerking as if she's some stripper at Magic City. She wouldn't do that because she would have too much respect for herself. And even the women at Magic Cities would come off the polls because they would say, I don't want my daughter to follow in my footsteps because I want her to have some respect for herself. But we don't do that. We say that that's playing respectability politics. So as I said, if you're a community and you use respectability as a pejorative and you think whore hop and whore culture is empowering, you are going to be in trouble. 
And that's and that's what the great separation is about. And I think some people see it. Some people starting to wake up and say, look, we can't build with these people. You can't build with Cardi B. You can't build with Megan Thee Stallion. They want to kill off all your offspring. You a man. You say I'm a king. What does a king need? He needs a queen. He needs territory. As soon as you meet your queen, she says, mm, I don't want that baby. And you say, well, whoa, well, how am I supposed to be a king? That's that's where we are now. And, and I would like for our leaders, the Afrostocracy, to take some responsibility for the way that they've mismanaged our community for the last 60 years. But I know they won't do that unless the white people tell them to do that. And as I said, as I say all the time, where we find ourselves as it comes to race is, is because of the symbiotic relationship between white liberals looking for absolution for sins that they didn't commit and black liberals looking for empathy for injustices that they didn't endure. Those two groups are locked in, in a relationship with one another, and we need to break that if we want to see any progress. Thank you, Delano. Uh, I, I'm gonna let you go, I gotta keep it moving, but I, I'm gonna put a button on Delano's point. Just, just I'm gonna add a little touch of humor to his point, just to hammer it. His point about like if, if white people all follow Elon Musk to Mars, and how whatever problems we have here as black people will still exist, white people gone. What he's basically saying is like, if they all go to Mars, Jason Whitlock is still gonna like fried chicken. And he's gonna have to fix his fried chicken problem if he wants to lose weight. That's what he means by that. Final, <laughs> final thought on this whole deal is this whole thing of, of racism doesn't exist. That's not remotely my message, Delano's message, point of this show. It exists. What's your best path of combating it? Commit to being a doctor for and therapist, Dr. Melfi for white people, or adopt these biblical values and principles that have the 2,000 years of collective wisdom found in the Bible, partner with Christ and other Christians, regardless of their ethnicity, Adopt those values, partner with those people, connect with those people, embrace those values within yourself. That will combat racism far better than Emmanuel Acho's uncomfortable conversations with white people, Ta-Nehisi Coates' books, Ibram Kendi's anti-racism speeches and uh, TED Talks. Those will do nothing. People running their mouth and flapping their gums They've been doing that for hundreds of years. Does not eliminate, does not even combat racism. Adopting biblical values and principles, applying those to your life, those actually work. All right, uh, I hear tomorrow. That's it for us. Uh, we'll see you next week. Making all this moves for freedom. I want freedom. No negotiation, my sister, no relation We all just wanna have freedom Sitting on the corner, never been alone I'm breaking my back for freedom Bless, we are living, get back We are receiving all the season We all wanna be free We want